God, you are the gardener of all creation. You planted this world with the seeds of your love and grow them with your faithfulness. We are your harvest. We find our meaning and sustenance in you. May our minds listen to you calling. May our hearts be attuned to your will. May our feet follow you in the world through Jesus. The word become flesh. Amen. Amen. Please rise and join me in the call to worship. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of seeds on earth. Give thanks to God, whose promised reign is coming. When we gather to worship God, we remember that we are God's people but we have often preferred our way instead of God's. Trusting God's power to make us new persons in Christ, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Holy God, the parable of the mustard seed teaches us that a little faith can produce great work in your kingdom. Yet we are too timid to bear the fruit of your righteousness, for we walk by sight and not by faith. Forgive us, Lord, we do not uphold the poor and oppressed. We do not advocate for the powerless or the vileless. We do not sacrifice ourselves for the needs of our neighbors. Renew us with the love of Christ so that we live no longer for ourselves, but for Christ who became the seed of your righteousness in us. Amen. We who walk by faith and not by sight believe the good news. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Praise be to God for the mercy and grace that forgives our sins. Alleluia. Amen.
here as well. All right. Uh, do you all know what these are? Yeah, Bibles. Bibles. They, they are, well, they don't look like Bibles, do they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Bi Bibles look a lot bigger than this, right? <laughs> but, 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 they, but they are, right? Yeah. yeah, it's exactly what they are. In fact, yeah, you, you can hold that and you can look at it. It's got lots of words. It's got all the New Testament and the Psalms and Proverbs. You know, I have a little Bible like this and it it does, and you have a little Bible. In fact, uh, this Bible that I have, sit, sit down. There is no pictures in that one, fortunately. But this one, it's a little bit bigger, but it's still a lot smaller. This is actually the exact same Bible we have out in the pews out there. I, I'm, I'm going to hold on to this one, okay, for right now. Well, when we look at a small Bible like this, you know, what does that tell us? Does something have to be really, really big to be good? No, really good things can come in small packages too, right? Just like a small Bible. And that also tells us, even when we are kind of small, are, are you guys kind of small compared to your parents? Yeah, you guys, you guys are a lot shorter and a lot skinnier of some of us anyway. <clears throat> But, it, but seeing a Bible like this and knowing how important the Bible is, how great the Bible is, and all the good things the Bible can do for us, when we see it in a small package like this, it tells us God makes really good things in small packages, just like each one of you. You did find a picture in it, didn't you? Yeah. You did. You know, I have a American flag in my Bible. There's an American flag in your Bible, too? Yeah, I didn't realize there was one in this. Okay. The really great thing, guys, is that we don't have to be big. We don't have to have all the best of everything because God can use us just the way that God made us, even when we're small like we are now. So before you guys go and head down the aisle to uh, Miss Vicki, let let's pray. Can you guys pray with me? All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you that you make great things in small packages. Help us to be great in our small packages. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from Psalm 20, which can be found on the Pew Bible, uh, pages 456 and 457. I will read the odd verses, uh, you, the congregation, the even verses. But before we come and together read God's word, let us first pray for God's wisdom. Holy Spirit, by your mysterious power, speak to us your truth and show us your wisdom, that we may know you more deeply and serve you more faithfully. For the sake of Jesus Christ, amen. And now let us turn to the words of Psalm chapter 20. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your salvation and in the name of our God set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven and with the saving might of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, 
but we rise and stand upright. O oh Lord, save the king. May he answer us when we call. And now our second reading is from the book of 1 Samuel, beginning in chapter 15, verse 34. Listen again for God's word to us. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. But Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. The Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? He said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. This is the word of God. It's often important in life to be able to see beyond appearances. The things we see may not actually be what we think they are. Earlier this year, I watched a new season of one of my favorite shows, The Americans. Now, as one of an age to remember when there was a Soviet Union, at least in its last years, I really like the feel of this show. It does a really good job of making you feel like you're back in the early 1980s. Now, this is a series for more mature audiences, of course, but the main characters are Philip and Elizabeth Jennings. And like most of us, they care about their kids. They care about their jobs as travel agents, about their home. They follow the politics of the day uh, during President Reagan's uh, term in office. But in actuality, these two are Soviet spies living in plain sight. And their survival is dependent upon their real selves not being on display before the world. Now, many of us do not live as spies, I hope. But we can easily relate to the idea of hiding or concealing our true self from everyone else. Just as we see in others the things that they want us to see, we reveal to others only so much of ourselves, only the things we want them to see in us. And humans are quite easily misled, if truth be told. We even want to be misled by the fantasies and the illusions of the world and of others so that we see for us, seeing really ought not to be believing a lot of the time. Now we continue our journey today through the golden age of Israel. Last week we learned how the people requested a king. We want to be like all the other nations, so God give us a king. We don't want you as king any longer. And they got what they asked for in Saul. He was tall, he was handsome, he was charismatic and good looking. But now some time has passed and he's been disobedient to what God has said to him. So God has rejected this Saul in favor of another. So the one that is chosen by and requested by the people will be replaced by the one that God has chosen. That is where our reading begins. But rather than being a passage dominated by one of the largest figures of the Old Testament, that is King David, it begins and is largely focused on that same Samuel, the last judge of Israel, 
the one who anointed not only Saul but David as king. And we find him here at the outset in a state of grief. And it's easy to gloss over that feeling and get to the more important stuff about the choosing, but we should stay there with that grief for just a moment. Because the God of the Bible is portrayed as an intimate, involved, and engaged God. One that is intimately familiar with and enmeshed in the details of our everyday life. And the same is true of Samuel, even in the depth of his depression and loss. Because we can think of how much time, how much energy, and likely how much hope he had that Saul would prove to be better than he actually turned out to be. It seems that all Samuel has done will be for naught. And there's a loss in that. In this way, our reading begins with a word of comfort, actually. Comfort in that it reminds us that wherever we go, wherever we end up in life, God is there with us, walking with us. Whenever God tells us to get up and go, God gets up and goes with us as well. When we hear the command of God like Saul, we know we go nowhere alone. Now Samuel, from his time in the temple as a little boy until now, has spent an entire life listening for responding to and following the word of God. And he's doing so even now to the end of his life. He continues on in that same way. And he begins what author and Methodist pastor Jason Basie calls God's insurgents. Because make no mistake, when Samuel follows the word of God and sets out to anoint another king, even if David himself, even if his father and brothers didn't fully grasp what was going on, because the text just says that David was anointed, not that he was anointed king yet, That'll come later. But make no mistake, what Samuel was doing at God's behest was an act of treason against his king. And we know that even a quick glimpse of Saul of Gibeah shows him to be a king that is paranoid and obsessed with keeping power at all costs. So this treason, this insurgency, we see it in the overall scope of the reading. It actually looks really weak. Because the smallest, smallest and the scrawniest is the one that is going to take on the tall, the good-looking, the well-spoken Saul. This is the one that is going to follow him. Really, the runt. The one out in the fields. The one that is so forgettable, he wasn't even invited to the meal. This is the one God's going to go with. So to really get what's going on, we have to get to the heart of the matter. Which in this instance is, in fact, the heart. The heart can represent for us today all that is interior, all that is beneath the surface, all that runs things behind the scenes. But we too often are not willing to look with any amount of depth at people or at things. We shake our heads at children when we see how easily they are suckered in by sugary cereal, cheap but brightly colored toys. When they can't see beyond, when they can't see the real worth of something, we just kind of wonder and say, oh, hopefully they'll be better when they grow up. But honestly, when we grow up as adults, we're just as guilty at looking only at the surface. Now, yes, we do it for different things, but we look at the surface too. Would any politician really be elected if we looked at them with true and piercing depth? If we look beyond the clothes, beyond the jewelry, beyond the prepared speeches that they give? Study politics for any length of time, and you realize there really is not a whole lot of difference between any elected leader, even if they have an R or a D by their name. They all wear clothes that likely we could never afford. They wear jewelry that we will never be able to own. They live in homes that most of us, even with a lifetime of savings, could never possibly afford. And in the end, they give us an image. They sell us an image, and we buy it because we see what we want to see. So before we are too quick to shake our heads or wonder why this is, we have to face the reality. They give us what we want, what we ask for and demand. We see what we want to see, we hear what we want to hear, and they know what we want to see. They know what we want to hear. So at the end of the day, who really is to blame? But before we lose hope that we have completely lost our way, We read an encounter such as this, and we realize that this has been the dance between leaders and their people for quite a long time. But for even longer, this has not been the way that God 
has chosen leaders. This is not the way God raises up a leader in the midst of people. In another act of free choice in an entire scripture full of God's free choices, God freely chooses another. Now, God does not choose like we would choose a Moen faucet. We don't buy it for looks and buy it for life. That's not God's way. God does not select leaders like Burger King where we can have it your way. God chooses by going to the heart, by looking beneath. Now, God references the way that humans look and assess. We do it with our eyes. Now, eyes are good. Eyes perceive so much. But their location is actually their limitation. Because when we look with the eyes, when we judge with the eyes, particularly when we look and judge another person, what kind of person they are, are they good, are they bad, do they think like us, act like us, the judgment ultimately resides with the one who's doing the looking, with us. We who are unperfect, we who are biased, we who see what we want to see. But God looks somehow in a way that we rarely, if ever, can look at others. We look, God looks beneath all of that, at the heart, at the actual person or thing that is being observed. It is a truer, a more factual judgment, one we can't do, but one that God can and does. God looks beyond the makeup, beyond the clothes, beyond the titles, the reputations, the education, the trainings. God looks beyond all the way that things are supposed to be and sees things as they really are. And God has often made a habit of choosing the most unlikely, the most seemingly unworthy people to be the greatest people, to do the greatest things. Jacob was the second son, not the first, but he was chosen. Joseph was chosen, one of the youngest of Jacob's children, but in fact was so despised his brothers sold him into slavery just to get him out of the way. Moses was also not the firstborn, and as leader of the nation was also a terrible public speaker, the one who had to go up against Pharaoh, against the greatest military and political might of his day, stumbled over his words all the time to where Aaron, his older brother, often had to speak for him. We should not be surprised when God chooses the unlikely, the least of these, the one that nobody saw coming. No, we should be more surprised when God picks somebody like Saul, or like David's older brother, Eliab, the one that is tall, the one that is good-looking, the one that is good with people, the one that people look at and say, yes, now there's a king we can follow. But God looks at people with kingdom vision, not with people vision. And kingdom vision is what we all have to seek as well. Now, even though God states his reason for choosing our interior, we still have a physical description of David. He was probably a good-looking young man, but he was still the runt. Funny how even though God has said, I don't look at things on the outside, we still have to give that outward look and that appearance because that's all we can see. That's all we can wrap our minds around. Now, the actual reasons why God chose David are not clear. There's an implication that there is something more to David than we could ever see or realize, but we don't know exactly what that is. He has something his older brothers doesn't. He has something nobody else does. He has something extra. But even that something extra does not come until God says, this is the one. Because that extra key component, that thing that is added to David's internal qualifications, the one thing that he does not have but soon gets is the addition of the Spirit. That Spirit that will equip and guide and protect David from that day through all the days of his life. The Spirit that will be there at all of his greatest triumphs as well as his greatest failures. Because as high as David went, David went equally low at other times. But it was that same spirit that David, in those low places, would turn to in repentance. Just as he would turn to that spirit in joy and in worship and in all things. All the right stuff about David doesn't matter without that spirit. But that spirit doesn't come before God says, you know what? That's the one. It's all a matter of God's choice. And the same is true for each of us in the same way. We are God's choice too. All the best and the brightest with God, it all takes a back seat to God's chosen and beloved. That is the greatest truth of Scripture in its entirety, that we are God's chosen. Not because we've earned it, not because we're smart enough or good enough or good-looking enough, 
In fact, when we think about why would God choose any of us, the decision may be as perplexing as why did he choose David? Reasons we may never know. And in the end, the reasons why really don't matter. What really matters is the reality that God does love us, that God has chosen us, and that God, because of that, can use us and make us all that we can be, who and what we are for God's glory. And all it really requires of us is a willingness, an acceptance, a willingness to stop looking around, to stop judging our own insides by the outsides of those around us. God sees something in all of us, and that is enough. It is enough because through that choice, through that decision, we are all connected beyond ourselves, beyond ourselves together. We are with God's Spirit. And with, those, and with that, as Paul says elsewhere, all things truly are possible. So we take comfort in the knowledge and the belief that as unlikely as any of us could be, we are enough. We're enough for God to say yes Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, is in totality probably the most unlikely of choices for a Savior. Yet, I think it was precisely those unworthy, those humble qualities that he had that I think allowed the average people of his day, the forgotten people, the pushed out people, to draw close to him, to come around him because they saw something in him that they could relate to because he was one of them. He is one of us. He didn't have it all yet, but he did have the Spirit. And we too have access to that same Spirit. Now this account of the changing of the guard demonstrates because David is not truly anointed and made king of all Israel here. No, we have to wait till 2 Samuel chapters 2 and 5 before that happens. We see with this changing of the guard that the change and the preparation for great things is never easy. It's never quick. And as Samuel could tell us, it is rarely without some pain. But what this reading also tells us is to trust the process, to trust that God is in that process with us, a process begun and completed by God, the one who goes with us wherever God sends us. So pray then for the wisdom to see, to see not with our eyes, but to see as God sees. Ask others who also endeavor to see with God's eyes what they see, to speak to us about the things that lie beneath, the things that they can see if we are willing, that God can show who we really are, what we might do, the people we might be. Pray for the ability to see, not as we see now, but to see as God sees, to see with heaven's eyes. This is our call. And this is our hope, and praise be to God. Please be seated. We come now to a response of faith, uh, something we uh, have not really done before, but as you can see, our response of faith is from the Confession of Belhar, Article 1. And there's a uh, portion of the announcements that speak about this. Uh, the Confession of Belhar has recently been proposed for addition into the Book of Confessions of our denomination. And about a month, month and a half ago, it actually received um, enough affirmative votes from the presbyteries in our country uh, to be included as well. That's the second of three steps that are needed to actually add this. Um, and in recognition of uh, it passing that step and in the likely, uh, uh, the likely situation that it will likely pass that third step, which is being voted on and approved at next summer's a General Assembly, uh, we figured the best way to present this confession is to do so in worship. So today we do that with Article 1, uh, the first paragraph where we will respond in faith and we will read the text in its entirety. Uh, next week and in subsequent weeks, the readings will likely be a bit longer and more responsive in nature, but now let us begin to uh, understand and appreciate uh, this document with the words that are found in your bulletin. Would you please read with me Article 1. We believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who gathers, protects, and cares for the church through word and spirit. This God has done since the beginning of the world, 
and will do to the end. Thank you. As we come to our time of prayer, uh, I draw your attention to uh, the back page of the bulletin that has a listing of uh, the individuals, families, and situations that we are currently in prayer for. Uh, we remember to continue to lift up and uphold, especially Becky Wright, uh, Pastor Ray Rady, uh, Janet and Larry Bruns, who are with us here today, uh, Glenn and Jean Push. Uh, we give you thanks for the mission trip that Maggie Tate has recently completed. We continue to pray for Jim O'Brien, uh, Ann Haywood in her recovery from surgery, Joan White in her recovery from a stroke. Uh, we also lift up Connie Downs uh, in a time of discernment as well. We pray for Vacation Bible School, for all those that will attend and all those that will lead. We pray for the Meals on Wheels ministry in our community. We pray for Dinner Season with Love, our next monthly meal being next Saturday. We pray again our thanks for Missions for Taylorville, uh, which began last Saturday and will again take place in September. And we pray for all service ministries in our community, in our country, and around the world. Are there any other joys and blessings or needs and concerns that we would lift to God at this time? All right. Absolutely. We are very grateful that uh, Mario Garza Sr. is with us. We've been praying for him for many months, and we're glad to have you here with us today. Seeing and hearing no others, let us take these and all that is on our hearts and minds to God in prayer. Lord our God, who created all things and promises us an eternal realm, hear our prayers of intercession, those that are spoken and those that are unspoken. We pray for peace. Eternal God, you sent us a Savior, Jesus Christ, to break down the walls of hostility that divide us. Send peace to the places where greed, pride, and anger turn nation against nation, race against race, church against church, person against person. We pray for the leaders of the church and of the nations. Mighty God, sovereign over all, give the leaders of the church and the leaders of all the nations the vision of your kingdom, that they may lead us all with justice and goodwill. We pray for the earth, for God's creation, God of creation, you made all things in your wisdom and love. Grant us all a reverence for the earth, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. We pray for those who are in pain, in pain in body, mind, and spirit. Merciful God, you bear the pain of the world. Look with compassion on those who are sick. Stand with those who sorrow. Reveal your light to those living in darkness. Show them hope by your word. Bring healing as a sign of your grace. Let us pray for friends and families. God of love, bless us and those we love, our friends, our families, those who are not even our friends, even our enemies, so that by drawing close to you, we may be drawn closer to each other. For all that we have said and all that we have left unsaid, we give all things to you. And all these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, who died for us, who rose for us, and reminds us of your saving grace. So hear us now as we pray in the way of Jesus Christ, as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Friends, no longer regard yourselves or others from a human point of view, but from God's view. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Go forth from this place, knowing that you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. May God grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans according to God's good will. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
Alleluia. Amen.